Hello? Okay, thanks. Okay, hi, I'm Fritz Obermeyer. This is JP Chen. We're on the Pyro team in Uber AI Labs. And uh, we're gonna tell you about uh, Pyro, our open source deep universal probabilistic programming language. Uh, I'm gonna start out with uh, an overview of the Pyro language and tell you about a couple applications of Pyro here at Uber. And then JP is gonna tell you about our, uh, our, some of our engineering practices and our uh, open source community. So this is our team. We have five uh, core team members and then we're led by Stanford professor Noah Goodman. We also have uh, Yu Fan is a, our biggest open source contributor. He's visiting us today. Uh, and JP and I are here and, and Yu Fan is, are here. So you're welcome to chat us up later in the day. Um, so let me, let me describe uh, why we built Pyro and why probabilistic programming languages are interesting. So I've spent most of my career building bespoke inference algorithms for different probabilistic models. Probabilistic models are great because they help you model uh, uncertainty in artificial intelligence. Um, but we really wanted something where we didn't have to build custom inference algorithms over and over again. Each of these, each time we build a, you know, I used to build a model, I used to spend months implementing some inference algorithm to get this, uh, to get inferences working in this model. In Pyro, we wanted to build a, you know, in, and in probabilistic programming languages in general, the goal is to build a very general modeling language and then have somewhat automated inference um, so, that, so that we don't have to spend months every time we change the model to, to build new inference algorithms. So in Pyro, we, we, and in probabilistic programming languages, we want to leverage high level programming languages to describe very complex probabilistic models and have somewhat automated inference. The deep part of deep probabilistic programming is, is also integrating neural networks into these models. Um, that allows us to scale to, to larger data sets. Ah, okay. So some of the, so, uh, Pyro is built as a, a research platform mostly in, inside AI labs, and it allows us to uh, work on modern probabilistic AI. For example, um, um, we can do architecture, some architecture search or structure search, um, inverse graphics. Um, and and th that's much easier to do with a, with a deep probabilistic programming language. Whereas each of these papers that, are, that do similar things have had to write a lot of custom code um, for each new paper. Our design goals, when, once we decided to build Pyro as a, as a deep probabilistic programming language, our design goals, we, we were, um, uh, we, we chose four, four design goals to focus our efforts. So we tried to make Pyro universal, scalable, flexible, and, and minimal. And it turns out that just by building on top of PyTorch, so PyTorch is, a, is a, one of the most popular deep learning frameworks, maybe um, arguably, arguably second to TensorFlow in uh, the research community. So just by building on, on top of PyTorch, we were able to um, satisfy this, th these design goals of universality and scalability. It's universe, building on top of PyTorch allows us to be universal in that PyTorch's uh, compute graphs, its, it's, its computations can be dynamic, so they can have control flow, and PyTorch builds right on top of, of Python. Um, Rather than, so in contrast to say TensorFlow where you write code that de defines a compute graph and then execute this, PyTorch code executes uh, basically line by line. It's closer to what TensorFlow is releasing as TensorFlow eager. So we're allowed, so by universality, um, I mean that we can, we can allow programs with control flow basically, loops, conditionals. Um, uh, building on PyTorch also allows us to, to write scalable machine learning algorithms because we can leverage GPU or multiple CPUs um, and we can uh, build, build on top of neural networks that, whose training involves stochastic gradients so that we can use uh, subsample training. We can train on mini batches of a, a very, very large data sets. Uh, to achieve these other two goals of flexibility and minimality, we've created a, a three-level architecture of a, a user-facing language, um, a, a low-level effects library, and then a set of high-level inference algorithms 
that you can use to train models. The language is, is very lightweight. It just consists of a few primitives on top of Python and PyTorch. These are the sample, plate, and uh, param primitives that I'll talk about later. Then we have a low-level effects library. This is a library of algebraic effects. That's a programming language concept. So this is, it's mostly for internal use, but this, this is a, um, a really powerful pattern that's since been adopted by uh, the TensorFlow folks. Um, and then using these low-level effects, we build higher-level inference algorithms, combining them in different ways. So I'm going to get down to some details about the way our particular language is, is shaped, what our, what our modeling language looks like. And we spend a lot of time in Pyro to make the modeling language as sleek and usable and intuitive as possible. Um, so the first, the first, uh, first I'll go into primitives. So these, these basic Pyro sample statements that um, are the, the, the tiny bit of, of DSL that we add to uh, Python and PyTorch. So the first statement here is the Pyro sample statement. Uh, that's, that's just a recording in Pyro of some uh, random number generator sampling, okay? So a Bernoulli distribution, that's just a, a coin flip distribution, right? So here we're, we're simply sampling, we're basically flipping a coin. We use a pyro.sample statement to register that coin flip in Pyro so that Pyro can do things with it. It can um, record its probability, things like that. This is, notice the Bernoulli object here is a, that's, that's just a PyTorch distribution object. So that, that's basically something that lives upstream in, in the PyTorch library, not in, not in Pyro. And we name this sample statement by a, a name so that we can do things with it later. We can write inference algorithms that look at all the different names in a program, these named statements and do things with them. One interesting thing to note is that the result of this sample statement is an actual tensor. It's an actual, uh, just like a PyTorch tensor, it's a tensor object. In many other probabilistic programming languages, the result of a sample statement is some symbolic distribution object, okay? Um, in Pyro, by, by having a very uh, concrete result of this, a tensor, just like you would output in a non-probabilistic program, that makes it really easy to program with Pyro because you can do the same things you could in a Pyro program as you could do in a normal PyTorch program. Um, uh, yeah, in particular, it makes it really easy to debug and, and print things out, just like, just like the advantages of PyTorch or TensorFlow Eager over, over more symbolic uh, graph frameworks. The next sample statement is actually an observe statement. It looks like a sample statement, but we have an obs there. So we're pinning this particular ob, uh, result of a distribution to some observed data. This isn't very interesting because it's, it's a normal distribution, but if I, if I had, had learnable parameters, trainable parameters in that distribution, I could then fit those parameters to match the, the observed data. If I have multiple uh, observed statements, then I can fit those parameters to match multiple data. And the way we, the third uh, statement is a param statement, and that's how we register a parameter as learnable in Pyro. Um, here we, we register it with a name, an initial value, and that initial value is only used the first time. Usually it's discarded um, once, we, once we start to learn a better value. And then we can optionally uh, constrain this parameter to do constrained optimizations. Here I'm constraining it with a, a positive object. And that's, that object is actually a PyTorch distributions constraint object, something that lives in the PyTorch constraints library upstream. The other uh, primitive we have is uh, a plate primitive. And this is interesting. Uh, this, this is used to declare statistical independence, um, something you might know of, or conditional independence, also known as exchangeability. So this is a little interesting we've, we found in Pyro. Because we're building on a tensor library, uh, we've, we've had to do a lot of new, we've had to, had to develop a lot of new um, techniques to deal with tensors that past probabilistic programming languages haven't had to deal with. The interesting thing about plate is that we have, we've had to implement two different versions of this that, that can trade off uh, uh, flexibility or universality with scalability. So in the first version, it's, it's a tensorized version or a vectorized version where we can draw multiple samples in parallel or execute multiple, um, I'll cross 
say multiple data in a mini batch in parallel. We could have big, big batches of data and operate in parallel across each of those and declare to Pyro that there's a particular tensor dimension that is the, the batch dimension, okay? But that requires that, you know, as all vectorized code requires, it requires that the control flow is the same along all paths. But sometimes we want to have uh, dynamic, uh, dynamic structure in our program so that for different uh, batch elements, we have different control flow. And for that, we use this second version of the, the, the pyro plate. In that version, um, we sequentially run through each item in the batch and we can have different programs that operate on, on different uh, batch elements. Also, it's nice because these two, these two patterns are, are uh, we can interleave them. We can use multiple, we can nest multiple uh, patterns. We can batch along two different dimensions and we can have one of those batch dimensions be static and another be dynamic. So that's, it allows a lot of nice trade-off. Often, sometimes I'll, I'll, uh, I'll be writing a pyro model and I'll uh, write a, a vectorized version, but then realize I want to change something. And it's really easy to switch between the vectorized and, and uh, not the, the sequential version. And then maybe I'll figure out how to speed it up, writing some extra vectorized code. So it, it's really nice to switch between these two. So now that we've seen the, the, the little bit of extra probabilistic syntax on top of Python that Pyro adds, we can build entire Pyro models. So Pyro models are simply Python functions. Um, idiomatically, we, we usually have those functions input data, but they don't need to input anything all, or you can input multiple pieces of data. So here's a, here's a simple example Pyro model. In the first line, we have a param statement. So we declare something as trainable. You can think of that as a, you know, programming with holes. There's a hole in your program. You sketch out part of a program, but you don't know what to put somewhere. So you say Pyro param, just fill that in, you know, figure out what it is based on data. In the second line here, we have a sample statement. So that sample is a categorical based on the probability, um, that this parameterized probability uh, tensor that we've declared on the first line. Next, we have some control flow. If we, if we restricted to programs without any control flow, then these, these pyro models would just be graphical models, probabilistic graphical models. You can think of pyro programs as exactly probabilistic graphical models plus control flow, plus loops and recursion and um, yeah, dynamic control flow. In the next line you see we have an observe statement that conditions, um, that conditions this distribution based on data. Notice also that it has a helper function. So because we're just using Python, we can write complex models that are split between help, helper functions and we can split complex models among different files or even different teams. Often we'll, like JP and I will be writing complex models for, for some team at Uber and we'll realize that some reusable, um, some part is reusable. And so we'll factor that out and then push it into our upstream, uh, you know, our open source repo. So we'll have a part of our models be closed source and then be able to publish some of them as, as uh, open source models to pyro.contrib. Next, I wanna go into a, a more detailed model that's a little more realistic. So one of the things we use pyro for is semi-supervised learning. Machine learning is often characterized along a spectrum from supervised learning, where you train on a lot of input-output pairs. That's how neural networks are usually trained. At the other end of the spectrum is unsupervised learning, for example, clustering algorithms or training embeddings. In the middle is semi-supervised learning where you have some unlabeled data and then a little bit of labeled data usually, okay? So here's a model that's similar to a VAE. VAE is a, is a, one, is a probabilistic way of training an embedding model. This is a semi-supervised VAE. And this is, for example, looking a model of uh, MNIST digits, the hand, handwritten digits data set. So let's pretend we have a data set that consists of a bunch of images of handwritten digits, and then a few of those have digit labels. There's an additional piece of uh, uh, unknown hidden, hidden variable here that represents the style, and we never observe the style. That's just like this um, uninterpretable embedding. Okay? So in contrast to um, uh, VA models with completely entangled um, entangled uninterpretable embedding latent variables. This is a partially detangled or disentangled uh, latent where we've 
split the latent variables into style and digit. Okay, so let's let's look at this model in detail. First, we declare we we define some neural network that's going to be a decoder network that's going to um, sample a random picture based on an embedding. Okay, this is this is a typical way to set up an embedding network. Later, we'll we'll also define a, an encoder network that's kind of an inverse to this. But let's let's just first pretend we've defined some decoder network, and that's just pure PyTorch code. Okay, just standard neural network code. Next, we'll define a model, and it optionally takes an image. Okay, I'll I'll get to that later. But the first thing we do is call pyro.module, and that declares that's basically a fancy param statement. Uh, the decoder is just a PyTorch module, so the pyro.module statement just goes through the neural network and de declares pyro.param on each of the network's parameters. So it's just like a recursive pyro.param statement. So that says, here's a decoder network and it's learnable. The next statement is to sample a random style and that just samples like an embedding vector. That says, I want my embedding vectors to be kind of uniform Gaussian embedding vectors. Then we sample a random digit from zero to one and then conditioned on the style and digit, we, we decode those together and then sample a binarized image. That's this Bernoulli distribution. We sample a binarized image from that and then condition on that in this observe statement. If a, the image is none, so notice, notice that there's, um, if you're familiar with Python, image can be either provided or not provided on the first line. If the image is not provided, then this is a purely generative model. You can run it and simply generate images. If you provide an image, then that's interpreted as conditioning this model to an image, okay? So we can then try to figure out what the conditional distribution of the digit is given an image. That's a classification problem. Uh, to solve that classification problem, we then define an inverse model. So where is the model, where's the forward model? See the, the, the way the uh, dependencies work here. Whereas the forward model samples an image given a style and a digit, the inverse model you can think of as the uh, as inverting the original model. It's given an image and then runs a classifier network to figure out what the digit is and then uh, runs a, an encoding network to figure out what the style is in some notion of style, okay? So this, this is also a pyro, a pyro program, uh, which we call a guide. And here we have two models or two modules, two neural networks that are encoders, one for the digit and one for the style. Uh, those are this, these two pyro.module statements. Uh, to run this program, we, we, we declare the two uh, modules, we run the sampler forward. Um, sorry, we, we, we run the, the digit encoder, which is like a, uh, um, which is like a classifier and then we can run the style encoder conditioned on the, 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 the image and the digit that we know that image corresponds to. And then finally, we sample uh, the style um, based on the, the encoder, encoder outputs. Okay, so finally, once, we, once we've uh, def defined these forward and backward models, we can, train these, we can train them jointly using stochastic variational inference. Or, uh, yeah, stochastic variational inference. In Pyro, we do that by creating an SVI object based on the model, the guide, some sort of deep learning optimizer. Here I'm using the Atom optimizer, which is a pop popular optimizer for deep learning models. And then a loss function. Here I'm using the Pyro's uh, elbow loss function. That's the evidence lower bound loss function, which is common in, in variational inference. And then, uh, then if you're familiar with uh, deep neural networks, the rest of it is, is pretty standard deep neural network stuff. I'll train on multiple passes through the data, multiple epochs. And in each epoch, I'll, I'll partition the data up into mini batches and then train on small mini batches. So that work allows us to work with really large data sets, but train on, on looking at just a few images at a time. So once we've trained, we've, we've defined our two models, we've trained the models uh, together, then we can use the guide, that's this inverse model, to take an image and predict uh, a digit and a style, okay? You can think of that as, as a classifier. So we've trained a classifier now. Um, another thing you can do is remember in that, in that guide, we had an encoder network. We had two encoder networks, uh, one for encoding the digit and one for encoding the style. So we can pull that encoder 
uh, the digit encoder out just as a pure PyTorch classifier, right? And that doesn't use any pyro at all. That makes it easier to productionize these models by completely pulling out the, uh, the pure PyTorch parts. And then PyTorch has, has ways of uh, writing those out to Onyx or other, other formats and then, and then deploying those even without Python. So in this example, um, we ran this and, and th these are results from back in 2014. I think this, this, this uh, paper was originally published by uh, Ingma and some other authors. But with, with using less than uh, 10, with labeling, you know, with labels on less than 10, uh, sorry, 1% of the data, you can already get 90% accuracy on the, on the classifier. Um, another cool thing about these disentangle latent structures is that you can sample random digits of a particular class. So you can fix the digit, right, to say an eight, and then sample random eights or sample random nines. So here we're sampling a style vector, but fixing the digit. Okay. Another cool thing is that here's a TSNI plot, a way of visualizing the, the embedding vector. That's this. Remember, we broke up the latent structure into the digit and then everything else, like this kind of embedding. So you notice that for the, our semi-supervised embeddings, it's all kind of a jumble. That means we've pulled out all of the interpretable. I've colored this by, uh, by digit. So we've pulled out all of the interpretable stuff, and everything else is pure style, and the style is this is this vector that's kind of shared among all the uh, all the digits. The little plot on the bottom shows what happens in a purely unsupervised case. In this, in the purely unsupervised VAE, we just have a single latent variable. Okay, the single embedding vector that encodes both the digit and the style. And when we do that, we notice that the uh, that embedding vector has to use most of its capacity to encode the digit, and there's not much sharing of style across digits. Okay, so it's so so one advantage of these semi-supervised models is that the embedding vectors that you have can share their their capacity across the different classes. Okay, now I'm going to move on to a couple applications we've we've uh, we've done at Pirate. Uh, yeah. Okay. A couple applications. What's that? Yeah. Okay. A couple applications we've done at at Uber. Um, so one is in time series forecasting. Uh, this, is, this is a plot generated by Suavex Meal. He, he, he does neural network time series forecasting here at Uber. And um, we've worked with him a little bit to develop variational inference models for time series forecasting. Uh, one thing we found in developing these, these time series models is that Whereas variational methods have often failed in the past, we've, we found that one thing that helps is to, to define more complex uh, variational distributions. So you see these two, of these two plots, um, one of them was, is using a, what's called a, a, the, uh, the, sorry, the, the far plot there is, is using the, uh, um, a mean field variational model. So that doesn't model any uh, correlation between random variables. And we found that um, by using a multivariate normal or a low rank multivariate normal model, we could, we could better model time series. Um, and I think we have one of the, the best uh, variational inference packages for, for doing that in Pyro. Okay, another, another application we, that JP and I work on is in Im image sensor fusion. And that's the idea of taking multiple like street level photographs and then combining those into an unknown number of objects. So we've built a pyro model to do that. And um, one, way to, one way we've done that is to sample uh, objects from a random distribution, sample where objects might exist, and then to sample from a, uh, an assignment distribution that's, that's kind of solving an assignment problem of detections to objects, and then uh, observing the, the detections given the objects. So the assignment distribution just matches these, these uh, objects to detections. And we can use a like modern loopy belief propagation solver to do that. And we've actually implemented that in our, in our, in our inverse model, in our guide. We've wrapped that in a, in a custom solver. And then the solver outputs just two um, probability distributions that we then uh, that we then wrap in, in uh, Pyro. This is kind of cool because it allows us to train the two distributions. This is, these are the two distributions that were in the original model. 
we can train the sensor distribution to learn sensor parameters like like how much sensor noise there is and we can train a prior based on um, <clears throat> uh, where, where we believe objects exist so for example on the the colorful plot here the green plot that's a that's a distribution that we've trained uh, based on side information of where intersections are. So we've trained this distribution to predict where signs might be, even without any photographs. Uh, these are, I think, stop signs. We're trying to figure out where stop signs are, given tons and tons of like a data center full of uh, street level imagery. Um, and then the other plot shows uh, our prediction on a few thousand Im images of fusing those together into predicted sign locations. Uh, Yeah, yes, we're okay. We'll just have a little bit more time. So, um, this is a rough map of, of what the, the Pyro code base looks like. And I just have a few points here. One is that we work a lot with the PyTorch team and we push a lot of code upstream. Uh, this is a little, even outdated. We also work with a couple other teams. We push some code upstream to NetworkX and another library called OptEinsum. So, we work a lot with other, other open source libraries. Um, another Thing I want to notice, point out is that uh, we have a lot of inference algorithms. We have this auto guide library that provides these uh, automatic inference models, amortized inference algorithms, and then a host of other inference algorithms. Our biggest, uh, I guess the one we focus on is stochastic variational inference. And that combines a bunch of different tricks from the literature. And each of these is really difficult to implement. And it's especially difficult to get them to work together. And, uh, that requires a lot of unit testing to get them to play, weather, uh, play well um, together. I break, I break this all the time and uh, our, tests, our tests help me uh, fix my PRs so that they, uh, they actually work. JP is gonna tell you about a little of our unit testing infrastructure. Thanks. Um, I think we're good on time, I don't know when we started. Um, so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about like our workflow and then what it takes to kind of um, keep this like big open source project um, you know, well oiled and sort of running. Um, so I'm sure everybody in this audience knows that like testing is difficult, right? And it's a non-trivial part of, you know, the, the software as a whole. And in some respects, I guess like testing is doubly hard for us because we deal with stochastic models, right? So what that means is if your test passes, does that mean, you know, your model was correct or you got lucky, right? And conversely, if it fails, um, does it mean that there's a bug in your code or, you know, you're dealing with models with high variance? Right. And so these are these are, you know, uh, kind of like a trade off and a very finely tuned like scale we have to balance. Um, and so because we're testing something as broad as a language, um, there's like a wide surface area we have to cover. Right. And so users can theoretically write, you know, any model they want. And then we have to be able to try to um, test for these. And so we leverage parameterization of tests um, very aggressively. So basically what that means is we te test like variants of models and we test every permutation of like the architecture and the different model parameters. Um, and then we exha exhaustively go through for like, um, like uh, code that we implement, especially the internals. And um, so in the limit of infinite samples, you know, you can retrieve the expected value that you want, but in practice, uh, we iterate, you know, quickly, so we can't have tests running forever. And so there's this careful balance between um, test cost and precision that we need to balance of, you know, how many samples do we need to draw to be um, certain to what confidence that, you know, this is correct, right? And uh, we, you know, and we try to bypass that as much as possible. So for instance, um, things like computing, um, like chaos, or, you know, this is like a, I guess like the objective term we want to um, compute, we, we um, anywhere where we can compute it analytically, we do the math and we compute it analytically and then we compare to approximations. Um, and then to make sure that these are, these are correct. We also compare um, like simple variants. So on the previous slide, um, there's all of these different, you know, techniques that like reduce variants and do all these like fancy bells and whistles. We compare them to base implementations and make sure that those um, agree with each other. Um, and uh, we also test, you know, performance regression. So making sure that, you know, when we change internal code, it doesn't uh, drastically, you know, uh, break performance. And we have cron jobs that we run um, on a cyclic, like daily basis to make sure that these like very large expensive models don't break. Um, even I, I just today, uh, PyTorch is like when they change their uh, random number, random seeds for the random number generators, they actually run pyro tests to see if, you know, all of their upstream code is working. Um, so that's something that, you know, we take seriously. Um, and then the other thing, I guess, for an open source project is documentation. Um, so documentation is important, both ex external and internal facing documentation. So that realizes itself in, um, so internal documentation is obviously documenting the code. Um, we provide references to all the, you know, the research and the implementations that we use. And we also 
make sure that the um, interface is very clearly um, defined and documented. And this also helps um, other open source contributors to contribute code, um, as a lot of people have done. And you know, and we we allow the flexibility when you need it. So if people want to bake in, you know, their own um, objective or like modify it a bit, it's very clear how to do that. So it gives a lot of flexibility to the user, and that's not possible if that's not well documented. Um, and then uh, we also make sure in our um, design of the interface that it's very uh, Pythonic, and if I follows like PyTorch idiom. So for instance, to declare conditional independence, we use context managers. Um, you know, uh, Pyro provides like very thin wrappers on top of like PyTorch constructs like, you know, tensors and neural net modules. So if you're like a PyTorch user, it's very seamless transition. And external facing documentation is things like tutorials, um, examples. Um, we maintain like a forum where we, you know, help answer questions about, you know, modeling in general and also, um, and things about, you know, uh, the Pyro language. I'll get into that in a bit. Um, so when we launched, um, I would say it was like a generally positive reception. Um, this is a screenshot from a uh, popular like machine learning YouTuber, Siraj. Um, he made this like video of like probabilistic modeling and how to build this with Pyro. I got like 36,000 views. Um, there's also been a lot of open source contribution um, that, you know, people have contributed basically their own research code into libraries that you can um, reuse. So things like um, uh, experimental design, things like object tracking, uh, our entire Bayesian optimization library was written uh, completely by an open source contributor, Du, who's visiting um, us at Uber this week. Um, so feel free to talk to him about that. This has all been like uh, widely used by other people and like shareable code. And that's uh, generally great to encourage. Um, there's also been a lot of, um, I guess, just, you know, users using Pyro for all sorts of things from like researchers and students um, to their startups doing like financial forecasting. Um, there's like health startups doing like time series predictions. Um, so, you know, I encourage you to, to check out, you know, these projects if you, if you want to uh, try something to get started. Um, we also pride ourselves in like a very open uh, design process. And so um, the PyTorch distributions was uh, led an effort by uh, Fritz and some members on our team. And it was a collaboration across like industries and uh, people from industry and academia across the world. And um, that's the actual design doc that they used. And so this was like open to everybody to, you know, kind of give feedback when we make um, design and interface changes, we pull a community to see um, you know, what people need and we try to uh, design for that. Oh, and, you know, we also maintain a forum where people ask uh, Pyro specific things, but also just about, I guess, like deep probabilistic programming, you know, building probabilistic models, how to do that. Um, and, you know, great place to get started. And that's it. Uh, we'll give special thanks to um, members of the PyTorch team and our open source contributors and uh, academic collaborators. If you want to check us out, um, you can just go to pyro.ai and we'll be around later if you want to um, ask us some questions. Thanks.